we've been finding ourselves all this month in our, what we call our financial series, series called How's Money? And, and this is a series where we've been coming around finances as we prepare our hearts for vision. Vision's coming. Every November, we take the whole month to focus on vision, the vision before us that God is setting before us as the church to stretch in and to believe for. Not only the vision for our church, but my prayer is that every vision month that God would stir a new vision within you for your family. That maybe God would ignite something within you for your business. That maybe God would remind you at vision month that His vision for you is not over, but He has a bigger vision still yet to come. And we know that it requires us preparing our hearts in such a way that we wouldn't come from small-minded thinking, that we would enlarge the capacity of our belief to believe that God doesn't just do big things, but that God does big things through me. That God would use us in the process of doing great things. And, And that's where we've been finding ourselves and preparing our hearts as we enter into Vision Month. And we're a couple weeks away, just a couple weeks away. Vision's coming. Vision's coming. Vision Sunday is the first weekend in November. If you had planned to be out of town, go ahead, call your travel agent, change your plans. It's definitely not a Sunday to miss. God's going to speak and God's going to do some things and you do not want to look back over time and say, I missed that one. It's definitely one you want to be present at. But I want to continue in our series called How's Money Today? And I want to read to you from a passage of Scripture. So before you take your seat, let's get, get your Bible out. And let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. And I'm going to read from verse 8. It says, One day Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop in there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I'm sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. And then he'll have a place to stay whenever he comes by. One day, Elisha returned to Shunem and he went up to this upper room to rest. He said to his servant Gehazi, tell the woman from Shunem, I, I want to speak to her. When she appeared, Elisha said to Gehazi, tell her what we appreciate the kind concern you have shown us. What can we do for you? Can we put in a good word for you to the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied, my family takes good care of me. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, what can we do for her? And Gehazi replied, she doesn't have a son and her husband is an old man. Call her back again, Elisha told him. And when the woman returned, Elisha said to her, As she stood in the doorway next year at this time, you'll be holding a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she cried. A man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. But sure enough, verse 17, the woman soon became pregnant. And at that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elisha had said. For week three, the series, How's Money? I want to teach you how to make room. How to make room. Ready for God's Word today? All right, well, I need you to do something as you prepare your hearts. Find the best looking person in your row and give them a hug. Husbands, choose your wife and then take a seat. Go for it, go for it, go for it, go for it, go for it. Hug somebody, hug somebody. Thank you, worship team. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to start out with a little exercise today. How many folks here have Instagram, the social media platform, Instagram? Would you please lift your hand just so I can get an indication how many people have Instagram? Keep it up if you're somewhat active on that platform or if you've let it retire, put your hand down. Uh, Okay, wow, that's a fair amount. Would you do something real quick? Would you just open your your Instagram? Go ahead, open your Instagram. Go for it for those who are, I am not sponsored by Meta, by the way. It's not an advertisement. Uh, Feel free at any time today, today to take a photo and to upload. In fact, we do have a page on our website called Sunday Best. That means uh, we've got our photographers running around each and every Sunday taking photos of you. And if you would like to post a photo of you, just go on the Sunday Best and the photo is there. You can just share it and tell everybody how amazing Vive Church is. But that's not why I want you to open your Instagram. If you happen to go to my profile, you're going to see a, a new title. 
that I put on there this week. A new title on my Instagram page, I added to my titles that I'm quite proud of, Father, Husband, Pastor. You'll see that I added the title Innovator. Yeah, someone got it, someone got it. Innovator. This is not a self-proclaimed title, by the way. I put it on there because this week I got contacted by someone who wanted to do, I don't know what you call it, a piece, an article, a, a page, whatever they call it, on me as their selected Silicon Valley innovator. I was like, that's new, but I'm down. It's cool. And, and we began a conversation about timelines of the church, a faith innovator. I thought, this is cool. Let's explore this and began to record the timelines of when things began, how we moved country and we brought everything we owned in 11 suitcases and how we started the church and how we went from, from and, and I began to tell him details and I shared something with him that as probably the pivotal moment that most people wouldn't even recognize as a pivotal moment. Because I was sharing with him how we were renting space in a, in, in a conference room at the Crown Plaza in Palo Alto. And at that time, we wanted to go to the JCC. We wanted to rent space in their brand new theatre. We had really no tithers at that time. We had Vance and Kim were tithing and Andrew Thomas's dad. That's about it. <laughs> That's lit. That's it. And yet, we wanted to make some big, bold faith moves as a brand new church, we're about to launch. And I remember having a meeting with the JCC. And as we, we were meeting with them, the Jewish Community Center, uh, they, they were like, we're down for this. I thought, first hurdle over. Okay, we're a Christian church in a Jewish Community Center. That's cool. We're, we're on the same thing. I remember having a conversation like, oh, sorry, we, only, we actually only lend to uh, Jewish uh, events. And I, I quickly pivoted. You know, this is a part of being an innovator. You gotta pivot on the moment, right? Whether you're given a pitch or, or you've got you to read the room. And I remember pitch, I said, well, did you know that Jesus technically, he was Jewish? And they're like, really? I said, yeah. And in the new covenant, the old covenant, Israelites were the people of God. In the new covenant, everyone who follows Jesus is the people of God. So in many ways, we are all Jews, Messianic Jews, in fact. They said, that's good enough for me. Let's get the money. That's literally how it worked, <laughs> literally. However, we got past the first hurdle. The second hurdle was we wanted to establish. So I said, I need at least six months locked in of Sundays. They said, we could do that, but you'll have to put a $10,000 deposit. And as soon as he said that, I laughed. <laughs> I laughed because I knew what was in our, in our account. You see, we had $10,000 in our account, but it was our emergency fund. After we'd spent everything, we arrived in January, we got up to August, we wanted to launch the church. We'd literally spent everything we had to start the church. We had $10,000, that was my safety net home. There's no welfare for an Australian pastor in America who doesn't make it. And, and, and I laugh because I'm like, that's just like you, God. <laughs> you, you, you want that last $10,000? And I tried to talk the guy out of it. I said, what about this? I'll give you a pastoral word. <laughs> As a pastor, before the Lord, a promise, we will not renege on the contract. He said, that's cool. And he said something. He said, as believable as you are, he, he said the word money talks. He said, money talks. Now we paid the deposit. That's why we're still here today, people. You're welcome. However, can I say this? Over the last 10 years, I have I've learned just how true that statement is, but not in the way you think. How many people have heard the saying, show me your, your friends and I'll show you your future? I want to give you another potent statement, which is in the same vein, that if we could see your budget, it would reveal what you value. You see, money talks in a way where it tells you what you value. That's what money says. That's what money speaks. That's what your money is saying about you. It's revealing what you value and it directs your calling. I call this VC money. I'm not talking about venture capital. I'm talking about value calling. <laughs> I'm talking about the value around your money 
is where you will find your budget. In preparation for this today, I, I did a review of my budget. And, and beyond the usual things, your mortgage, that takes a lot of your, your finances and building God's house, which we're committed to. What I was suspecting was true, that in our household, a lot of finances goes to hygiene. Let's categorise it as that. <laughs> hygiene, nails, <laughs> hair, products. There's four women in our household and so a big part of our value system apparently is products. That's what we seem to value. I wasn't one bit surprised. Equally as much as we spend, I think, on product was tuition. And it's my favourite thing to complain about, to be honest with you. Because I'm not the one spending the tuition. I'm spending it on every single female in my house. You cost me money to learn. But it's my favourite thing to complain about because I love it because that's our, vow, that's our calling. It's aligned with where we're called and so we're going to invest our money. And this is where the way your money talks, your money talks about what you value. I, I dare you to look at your budget because what you say you value might not line up with what you actually value. Oh, this is we're confronting right from the beginning. <laughs> it's not a financial peace seminar. This is not Dave Ramsey. This is a blunt Aussie going to tell you how it is. <laughs> I ain't gonna pretty it up. I'm not gonna ask you to put your money in an envelope. I am gonna ask you though to assess what you value. To assess what you value. Not what you think you value, but, but, but what you actually value. Not what you want to value, but what you actually value. You see, here, here's the thing, your money talks. It talks about your values, your calling, and it reveals your stewardship. So if your money talks and directs your life, my question is, how do we start talking to our money and directing it? I'm talking about Instagram, I, I put a post up this week, and, and despite the little engagement that it got, the, the statement is still very true. <laughs> Regardless of your interaction with it, Vive Church, uh, it's still a true statement. And this was the statement, I'm going to read it to you since you didn't see it, giving, <laughs> come on, it's real truth. <laughs> giving doesn't just reveal where your heart is, it directs it to where you want it to be. Wow. You show me your treasure, I'll show you your heart is. I also want to flip that to where you put your treasure directs where you want your heart to be. Yeah. To where you want it, this, is, this means that your heart is in your control. Your values are in your control but it takes some, some action, it takes some directing. Instead of it directing and dictating what we value, how do we direct our finances? Well, to do that, I have to revisit this idea that we began last week, this concept called margin. I need to come back to margin. I, I find that margin becomes a, a monumental piece of our stewardship. When we're talking about stewarding biblically, we have to really get the understanding and the concept of what margin actually means in the area of finances and beyond finances. How do we create margin? I began talking about it last Sunday, like every Sunday on the way home from church, I like to ask my, my daughters uh, what they liked about the sermon. I don't ask them what they think, I said, what do you like? <laughs> very, very strategic. And generally after them telling me how funny I am and awesome, they usually give me one piece that I could work on. One thing was they didn't seem to understand. They said, Dad, we didn't really understand. What does margin mean? And I thought I could help Vox Gen out today and everybody else who wants to know what margin means. So allow me to unpack it just a little bit for you, what it actually means to live with margin because the amount in which God can use you and your finances is not based in how much you make, but it's based in how much margin you have. Can I say that again? The way in which God can use you and your finances has nothing, it's kind of irrelevant to how much you make. Sometimes we can fall under the notion that if I made more, then I'd be more available for God. That if I was more wealthy, if I was like that person, if I had more, I want to tell you the way God uses people has nothing to do with, 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 with the amount of wealth that you have. It's got little to do with how much you actually make. It's got everything to do with how much margin you have for God. 
Are you with me, Fox Jen? Yes. And this is so significant because you could disqualify yourself so easily by thinking that God uses the blessed, <laughs> that God uses the wealthy, that God uses the, let's use that nasty word that nobody likes in church, the prosperous. Prosperity. <laughs> uh, the truth is that God uses the steward. That's who God uses. The one who stewards, whether it's a lot or you would consider it a little, it's how you steward it that positions you to receive from God. It's, it's the area of margin. It's the area of margin, 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 how much you have in margin. Another way to frame it, I, I, could, I could ask you, have I got room to respond to God? Yeah. I'd be good to write down your notes. No one's writing. Yeah. Yeah. Have I got room to respond to God? Because at a foundational level, you need to understand that God is looking for those He can partner with for His purpose on earth. This is what God is constantly searching for. He, he's looking for those He can partner with. God is all about partnership. He is. He is. His plan for provision his plan for blessing and yes to prosper is a plan that always plays out in partnership. In other words, God doesn't tend to do things alone. He can. He's God. I mean, He can do anything He wants. He's sovereign. There's no rule that says God can't. God can. God can do anything at any time because He's mighty, He's powerful and He's sovereign. However, God doesn't waste an opportunity to do it alone. He always partners with humanity to fulfill His plan on earth. And what God is looking for is He's looking for partnership. He's looking for stewards through which He can direct His purpose to achieve His plan. I'm just making sure I'm going at the right pace for us today. I tend to talk real fast when I get excited, so I want to calm it down and make sure I eyeball everybody, good communication skills, to make sure I help you understand that I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you, I'm talking into your world that God's looking to partner with people. This is God's plan throughout Scripture, we see it. We see Jesus emphasise this. Jesus did this at the feeding of the 5,000. Could have said, I'm just going to multiply this. No, no, you do it. Because like, they come to Jesus, how are we going to feed these people? He says, how are you going to feed them? He says, what do you got? I love that partnership. Jesus did the miracle, he held it up and it multiplied, but, but he worked with the disciples. The same thing at the wedding of Cana, when he multiplied the wine, he turned the water into wine, he said to the servants, you go fill the pots. God is looking for those available who will partner with him in his purpose on earth. This is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in his rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. God, God's into partnership. What, what He's ultimately looking for is, is who's available. Who's available? That's a powerful word. Who's available? Who's, who's available? Who's available? Who's available? We, we often think, isn't it crazy how much we think that God's looking for skill set? Has anybody ever thought about that? Like, like if I could just get more skills, that, that, then I'm, I'm more attractive to God, when most of the time God's just looking for who's available or who's offering what they've got and making what they've got, not what they will have, but what they've got available to God. This is so fundamental, but it's powerful as a reset to your understanding of the way, the, the way God wants to use you and you being a candidate for God to use on this earth. God's not looking for you to get trained up then. I love training, don't get me wrong. I love skilling up, don't get me wrong. But you can't disqualify yourself because you don't seem to have the skills that you thought you need for God. God can use a donkey and if God can use a shadow and if God can use a cloth, here's the good news, He can use you. He can use you. And that is not saying that you're a donkey. It's not saying you're a cloth. It's not like... He can use. You rem remember, margin is not about what you make. Margin is about how you manage what you make. I'm going to give you an example. I, I think we need to illustrate this for VoxGen. I, let's just say, VoxGen, in, in your part time job, just for easy math, you made, let's say you made a thousand bucks a month. They're like, sign me up. 
Could you imagine that? Make a thousand bucks a month, part-time job, after hours, after school, mowing lawns, doing something successful, part-time business. You make a thousand bucks a month and out of all your subscriptions and your fancy things that you buy on TikTok and the coins and the, the things that, digital tokens that you buy these days, uh, you spend $900 a month. Who can tell me what your margin is? 100 bucks, wow, my goodness, look at that, 100 bucks. Let's give it up for Vox Gen. Let's reset and just say you got so carried away with the digital tokens and you kind of went a little bit over the budget, you spent $1,100, how much margin would you have? Negative, negative, negative 100, my goodness. You get it, you get it, you get the margin. You get the margin. Let's just say you do it for 10 months. For 10 months, make a thousand bucks. Each month, you spend 900 bucks. At the end of 10 months, how much margin do you have? A thousand bucks, my goodness, or one month's margin. Can we put it that way? You have one month's margin. You have one month's margin, you've got to understand that I'm now available for God in a way that I wasn't just by stewarding. In, and I'm not just talking about in giving to the church. I'm talking about being, respond, being able to respond to God. I believe that God uses people to bring breakthrough for others. You ever been in a situation where someone's just shared with you that they're in a, in a, in a situation and you've gone, oh man, I'll pray for you. I love prayer, but I also love practical. I, I love that Prayer can also be met with, hey, let me help you. Let me, let me be the body of Christ. But when you don't have margin, you aren't available to be used by God. Maybe we need to dig in a little bit. I feel like you're just filtering this through. Oh, he's just talking about finances. This is, this is the kind of church. You know, how many people new today? Don't put your hand up. Just already judging. Oh, we came to one of those churches, one of the money churches. I'm, I'm ultimately using money because God does yes. to illustrate the point that He wants you to be available for Him. Yeah. And it's in the little things, believe it or not. Yeah. It's in the little things. It's in the subscriptions. It's in the, yeah. the little things that direct our finances. It's the shopping addictions, the interest payments, the, the cycle that we get on, we end up paying more for what we have already bought because we're locked into interest because we're in the thousand dollars a month earning. We spent eleven hundred dollars. Now we're in a cycle where the, the the credit is actually catching up, and we're paying credit on what we bought. So what we bought isn't actually valued at what we paid for it. And then we wonder, God, I want to get on the altar. And I want to get on my knees and say, God, use me. He's like, Would you manage your money? Would you steward what I've given you? Like like the altar moment is great, but what the altar moment does, it doesn't alter your finances, it alters your heart and your mindset so that you can go to work and bring the change to honour the Lord and be a good steward. Uh, uh, it's in the little things. I could say it's in the marginal changes. This is how I become not just a candidate, for God to direct His blessing to, but I become a person who God can flow His blessings through. That's the plan, that I would be a conduit of God's anointing, that I would be blessed so I could be a blessing to people, that I would be blessed so I could be generous. Not that I could be blessed so I could feel important or be blessed so I could have status or be blessed so I could be something else, but I just wanna be a flow through God. I wanna, I wanna flow it through. If you're gonna use anybody, use me. <laughs> Because I know God's going to use somebody. Remember, it's all about partnership. So if God's going to use anybody, let it be me. Anybody know what I'm talking about? God is going to, God is going to use somebody. I'm available to God. Whatever His purpose. Be it helping somebody financially or partnering with the vision, I'm available. It requires making room to be available for God. I know, I know the, the sentiment right now is, is, let's change it from finances just so I can stop offending people just for a moment. Sports have never offended anybody. Can I get my, my football? Thank you for passing it to me. That was so kind. 
How many people know, how many people know this game, football? This American-loved game, football, which makes no sense because you don't use your feet one bit. However, handball was already taken, I think, by the Aztecs, you know what I mean? So we had to use another part of the body. Football. Rob, would you come up here? And uh, where's Sil? Sil, come up here. Sil, come up here. Where's Brandon? Can we get Brandon up here, our worship leader? Brandon, come on down. All right, so I need, I need you guys to illustrate. Okay, Rob, you can take that. You could be QB, okay, quarterback. Now, you look like a great defender <laughs> against Brandon. <laughs> Seems fair to me. All right, you're going to be a receiver, okay? Okay, okay you're going to run the play. Now, 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 I want to use this illustration to help you. We've got a big stage out here. We can play sport on this stage. We can do whatever we want. Now, you're going to try and stop him. I don't know everything about football, neither do you. <laughs> but let one rookie tell another rookie, your job is to stop him from getting that ball. You know how to play football. She's trying to get the ball in his hands. But for him to get the ball in your hands, you've got to make some space. Should we run the play? Let's run the play. All right, let's go. Let's go. Okay, we're going to get the ball. Let's go. Take action. He's going to make some room. Look at this. Look at that. Look at that. Stop. Freeze. Freeze. Freeze right there. Freeze right there. Freeze right there. All right. All right. So check this out. Check this out. Good job. Good try. He's athletic. All right. So freeze right there. We have Rob who needed to get the ball in his hand and they took up a bit of sermon time. I'll be honest with you. I was like, when are you going to release that thing or what? But in order for him to release it, he had to make some moves to make some margin. And the distance between here and here is a measurement of margin. When you're in a position to receive what God has for you, the moves I make will determine the margin I have to be available to receive what God has. Are you, st are you with me? Oh, now it's clicking. We just had to go to sports. Get off my stage, get off my stage. They got it. We didn't need to run it again. I thought we'd have to run it twice. It's all about the margin. I can measure margin, but I gotta make moves in my life. I gotta make moves in my finances. I can't just say, God, I want you to use me. What God is looking for is those who will make the moves that will make the margin and say, God, here I am, I'm available. I'm available. I'm out here available, God. Pass me the ball. Use me. If you're gonna use somebody, which I know you're gonna, God, let it be me. Look how much margin I'm making. I'm over here, God. That's, that's what God's looking for. He's looking for someone who will make the, the moves to make the margin. Now you can measure your availability. Yeah. Measure availability. In fact, this is what we find here with the Shunammite woman. That's what she's doing with Elisha. She was making room to receive. It's a fascinating section of Scripture with multiple miracles that are happening in consecutive order connected to the ministry of Elisha. We've got miracles on miracles around Elisha as he had the mantle now from Elijah and he's ministering and fulfilling the, the work of his mentor and now he's out there ministering, doing crazy miracles as well. We see that this particular miracle just comes off the back of another miracle where Elisha helped the widow who had nothing left in the famine except a small jar of oil and he told her, to collect as many pots as she could to begin to pour out the oil. And then we see that the oil only stopped when she ran out of available pots to hold. There's a theme going on here. That as long as there were available pots, the oil kept flowing. The moment the availability stopped, so did the oil. Now we see the Shunammite woman. A woman from a town that really didn't bear much significance in Scripture, except that it was located between two important cities. And Elisha, the prophet who would travel by foot between these two major cities as he ministered, would often stop in this city as a partway point in the journey for a meal. And we see at the beginning of the story that she made her home available. She literally, as an act of generosity, invited the prophet in to have a meal. And he accepted in response to her generosity. Verse 8, one day Elisha went to the town of Shunem, a wealthy woman lived there and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, wow. he would stop there for something to eat. <laughs> wow. Oh, I love this. 
Her generosity had a rhythm to it. My job as a pastor, I'm convinced of this, my job as a pastor is not to convince people to want to be generous. I've actually found in most of my conversations that people want to be generous. They just can't. What stops people being generous is not a desire, it's a means. I've never met anybody that really is like, oh, I don't, I don't believe in giving. I don't believe in being generous. I don't believe in helping people. Not in my world, I haven't met those, but I have met people like I want to be. We just can't. Or I want to be, but I need the generosity. And so I'm convinced that our job, or my job as a minister, is not to convince you and tell you, you should be generous. I know you want to. Well, my job is to help you, position you to be what you want to be. What is innate within you as a child of God. Because God is generous toward us. As a mirror and a reflection of God, we desire to be generous. My job is to help you get to that place that you desire to be. To be generous. And what we see here is the blockage isn't desire, it's often availability. The Shunammite woman recognised an opportunity and through generosity made space for God. It goes on to say this in verse 9. She said to her husband, I'm sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. She had an inkling. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it and then put a bed in there, put a table, they made it nice, put a chair, a little, little lamp and, 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 and we'll have a, he'll have a place to stay when he comes by. This is interesting because what started with an act of generosity was met with an intentionality to make margin permanently for God. What, act, what started as a, I'll try it, be generous, actually was met with an intentionality. Now let's do this every time. So now let's, let's build a room. Let's make a room, let's make space Permanently. It's not like it's a tent. It wasn't like let's pitch a tent in the backyard. So let's make a room on the roof, flat roof homes. Let's put let's build an addition. Let's go to the expense to ensure that we've got an availability at all times for God. That we're sectioning out some of our life. We're sectioning out a portion as room. What's it for? It's for God. What do you mean it's for God? It's just in case God does something, in case God wants to do something, in case God calls on me, in case God needs something, in case God is looking for someone to partner, let me build a room so that this is the one that He chooses. I'm available for God. I'm available. This, this is what the tithe represents, by the way. That's what the tithe represents. But prioritizing God in the first tenth of our income and our increase. Actually, I wanna make sure I teach the tithe correctly. I, because I've been talking about the tenth, tithe being the tenth, but the tithe is not just 10% of your income. The Bible has three elements that are connected to the tithe, by the way. It's, it is 10%, but it's also the first 10%. Priority matters. And it's given into the storehouse. This is Malachi 3.10, classic scripture. You know it. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there'll be food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will throw open the windows of heaven for you. I'll pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. I love this. Try it. Put me to the test. Put me to the test. It's what I call a testimony. A testimony. Uh, put me, there's a dad joke for Vox Gen. Put me to the test. This is how you set aside margin for God that I'm determining where my value is. I'm directing my value. You see, the Shunammite woman made room for God to move in her world and it positioned her for a miracle. You know, being a wealthy woman, I'm sure there was a lot she could buy. But what she really needed, money couldn't buy. Like when he says, what can I do for you? She's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm looked after. I'm well taken care of. In other words, I'm not doing this to get. It's a great attitude. You can't turn God into a poker machine or into an ATM that if I put in, then I expect to get out. That's the wrong attitude to have. The Bible's very clear in the way God blesses, but don't dare turn God into a wealth creating machine that if I put in, I get out. That's the wrong approach. 
Even when she was asked, what could we do for you? She said, I'm provided for. I'm doing this out of an overflow of my heart. I, I've made margin. It's not coming out of the things that cost. I, I've made margin for this. I'm good. I'm good. And then Elisha began to press and prophesied that you'll have a son. Now, what's interesting about this story, for the sake of time, that if we were to read on, we would find that when her son grows up, he becomes ill and dies suddenly. Now, when this happens, she doesn't sit in misery and accept it as a part of life. She does something interesting. But check this out. It says in the next verse, in verse 18, one day when her child was older, he went out to help his father who was working with the harvesters. Suddenly he cried out, my head hurts. My head hurts. His father said, to one of the servants, carry him home to his mother. Like that. Get him home. Get, go to mum. Verse 20, so the servant took him home and his mother held him on her lap. But around noontime, he died. Check this out. So she carried him up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and left him there. She's about to run out to the prophet and find the prophet. But what she does first is she utilises the room she made for God. Throughout the story, we see that she had been faithful to make herself available to God. And God had been faithful to her, provided her a son. So we see a story of faithfulness here in this Scripture, that as she was faithful, as she was generous, it went beyond a one-time act of generosity to building in a process of generosity called faithfulness. I will be faithful to provide. And we see that God was faithful in providing a son as the prophet prophesied. And now the very thing that she had promised had died. She goes not into her bed, not into his bed, but she goes to the room that she had made available to God. Her experience with God's faithfulness caused her to call upon God because she had given and not lacked up till this point. Up till this point, God's faithfulness had been proven. So her conclusion is, why would God not be faithful now? In making room for God, she set a space that provided an opportunity, not just for her faithfulness and her stewardship, but for God to prove His faithfulness time and time again. But now that there was a moment where she did need something, where she did need a miracle, what she could draw on was the fact that she had made space for God. And in making space for God, God had proven her faithfulness. Now she could draw on the faithfulness of God and say, no, no, I am not, I am not gonna accept the fact that this is it. God, I've been faithful. God, you've been faithful. So God, I need you now. And she literally draws on the faithfulness of God. She goes to the prophet. She falls to her knees and said, did I not say, don't bless me unless you can sustain it. Did I not say, don't get my hopes up unless you can provide. And what we see is that she laid the boy on the bed in the room she set aside from God was the place where the miracle happened. The prophet comes through. The boy comes back to life. And we see that the very place that she set aside for God was the, not just the miracle for others, not just the miracle that God could use, but the miracle that she received. God is looking for those who are gonna make some moves, to set some margin, to be available for God. If you hear anything in this sermon, let it not be condemnation. Don't just look at your life and say, oh, Shucks, I, I don't have any room. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Do you know how expensive it is to live in the Silicon Valley? I know how expensive it is. I've been a missionary for 10 years. I know what God can do. But I also know that God is looking for stewards that will begin to make some moves. You ever heard the, heard the story of Naaman? Naaman had leprosy. And Naaman had access to resources. And he was told that he could get a miracle, Elijah, in fact. But to do it, he had to go and do something menial. He had to wash in the Jordan 
And his conflict was, no, 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 I wanna do something great. I need like this move of God. I need you to wave your hand and the heavens to collide and something to happen for something to shift. When he's like, no, no, go repeat something. Go and repeat something. I'm trying to tell you the story is the same for you, that what God is looking to do to use you requires you to repeat something to budget each month, to live within your means, to actually make room for God. I know it's highly practical. Wouldn't it be great if I could just get up here and go, hey, we're gonna have an altar moment. God's gonna do something great. The heavens are gonna open up. The roof's gonna tear open. God's gonna reach down and just money's gonna fall in your life. It ain't gonna work like that. Being available and used by God comes from you saying, God, I'm making a commitment to make the moves I need to make, to position myself, to be available to be available. And if you're a tither, that's great. You've set room for God. But beyond that, can I make space in my world so that I'm ready for God? I'm ready for God. I want you to stand to your feet. I'm out of time. But I wonder what it looks like to make moves. I'm hoping the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now if you're listening. Listening in such a way or maybe He's identifying some things that you've held on to that you could honestly say, all right, God, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. You know, the things that often have to go in order for me to make room are the things that are attached to my self-worth and identity beyond what's important to me. The things that I know I'm overspending in or the things that I have put out there that's hurting me and buckling me, but I'm holding it as a status. They're the things that God often wants so that He can be your status, that He can give you identity beyond what you've got. Oh, I know I'd love, I I know what you want. I know you want me to preach something that's gonna get you to say amen, but this is the stuff that touches the heart. To go, hi God, I do wanna be used by you more than anything. So why don't you ask God, would you close your eyes right now? Close your eyes right now, right right across this place. This is a moment between you and God. And some of you might be in a, what, what you would consider underwater already financially. This whole conversation seems impossible because maybe you're barely making ends meet as it is. And the notion of reducing or adjusting seems impossible. I'm praying the power of God and His provision into your life. But there are some of you who know that you've made more, but you've spent more. (laughs) That you're in that position where the more you make, the doesn't seem to change anything because your lifestyle also begins to increase and add and you could keep making more, but you know it wouldn't be more available for God. But I truly believe that for us to see revival And a move of God requires people saying, God, I'm setting some things aside. God, I'm seeking after You. I'm ordering my life like a good steward and positioning myself that I would be a well done and faithful servant. That I wouldn't come back to God saying, God, I tried to live this life. I tried to match levels with everybody and I tried to look the part. But You literally said, God, it didn't matter to me what people thought. I honoured You and I used what You gave me for Your Kingdom, for the eternal purpose of heaven. God, I'm praying right now for each and every person here that is deciding in their heart to make moves, to make the adjustments, to make the moves, to move into a position of availability. Maybe for some, it's a greater level of availability than you ever dreamed possible. In a position where God will speak and you can respond. Not saying, God, just wait a couple months, I might get that together, but God, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to move. I'm ready to respond. I'm ready to give. I'm ready to sow. I'm ready to be the person through which you flow your finances through. So God, I pray you would empower each and every person here. At whatever level they're at, wherever they find themselves, Lord, let us extend beyond finances. Let it extend to our gift set, our anointing, our skill set, our time. That God, we would make moves in our time to be available for you.